Okay, so um, there'll probably be the occasional other person filtering in, otherwise they've lost their laptops. Um, so, but mostly people are back. So um, we had this example to look, to look at. What's the first thing we should do to speeding it up? Yes, we should time it. So we set up the turn on the profiler. Um, run the code. There's a sort of trade-off in how many, how long you want something to take if you're profiling it. Because if you're only running it, if it only takes a second or so, you're sampling isn't going to be very effective, whereas if it takes a week to run, then you don't want to run it, modify it, rerun it, remodify it, and so on. Okay. Okay, actually, while we're at it, why not look at what that profiling output looks like. So this is what it looks like. You've got these stack traces, one per line, lots and lots of lines. And then the thing at the top is just saying how, how often is it sampling, and that's every 20,000 microseconds. Okay. So what does the results what do the results say? Well, um, the biggest the function that's taking the largest amount of time is as dot character, which is kind of surprising because, well, we're for a start we're not actually calling as dot character anywhere. Um, this is the sort of thing where the prof tools, where, you know, where a more sophisticated display of the call graph would be useful. Um, we can also often just look at this thing ordered by total time and see where as dot character appears, what it's next to. Uh -huh. There it is, yes. So we might well suspect that it's um, that these sort of go together and that um, that's where it's happening. What else do we see up on this list? Uh, D-pass is also so taking quite a long time. Um, Uh, it is your user, are you using R3.5? No, no. Ah, well if you type version at the uh, R command line. I, I am using 3.5 and I'm helping. Exactly, that's right. So, Tomasz, take a bow. And Luke, take a bow. <laughs> so this is one of the improvements in, um, in R3.5. Um, is that um, the, I forget exactly what it is, but it's something to do with the row names of the design matrix um, not being explicitly constructed. So the, before R3.5, LM spent a ridiculous amount of effort constructing the row names of the design matrix, particularly ridiculous because they're extremely boring. They're just one, two, three, four, and so on. And uh, this is one of the fixes in one of the improvements in R3.5, and um, the it, along with the alternative representations, internal uh, changes to the language. So, if you're using R3.5, then you will have a different. Then this is an example of the sort of thing that changes, and why you need you often need to re-test when you get new versions of R.
the uh, quote from Brian Ripley about um, preconceptions being need to, need to be checked against um, evidence. Because different, you know, when, while it's difficult to re-engineer R and remove uh, slow things from base R, it does happen from time to time. And it's recently, there's at the moment a period of it happening. So the chain, results of timings like this are changing faster than they have in a lot of R history. So what do you have as the top? No, it's the top of your profile. Yes, okay. So these top, my top four basically have gone away uh, as a result of the improvements in R3.5. Yeah. And LM fit does nearly all the work of linear models, but it's only taking 3.5% of the time. So, this is an example where we're not actually, it's not obvious from this what we should do next. Um, one thing that's, since there are things involving characters and passing and depassing going on, one, um, <coughs> one potential thing to do next is this as.numeric of the SNPs um, to, we're doing that every at every opportunity. We should just do it once rather than doing it thousands of times. That can't hurt. And since there are weird things going, since weird things happen with factors and characters and passing and so on, and this is a, a weird things are happening here, that's a thing reasonable, something reasonable to try. So the example BP2, <coughs> example BP2 does the as numeric once as pre-processing rather than doing it every time round the loop. And, you know, we've improved things a little bit, but not very much. Um, LM fit is still only taking just over 5% of the time. So this is a difficult one. It turns out that what we need actually is to re-engineer the low-level workings of R, which is not typically an option that's available to us. Uh, the other sort of thing you can do, which is annoyingly often an example, um, what you need to do is to try and rewrite the code to, to not do any more work than you need to, as we did with t-test. So here, the problem here is that in more progressively more difficult examples, it's progressively harder to do that sort of rewriting. We should hope that anybody could rewrite t-test. You need to know a little bit of linear algebra and least squares regression theory to rewrite LM. And if you wanted to rewrite LME, then you need to be Doug Bates. And so, but LM here is a sort of intermediate case. So we've got a new LM that takes as arguments a design matrix and a response variable. It calls LM.fit which also takes a design matrix and a response variable. And that gives you the fitted values. What it doesn't give you is the standard errors. If you either look, up, look it up in a book or look at the code for summary.lm, uh, you can find that this is how you compute the standard errors. The easiest way is to look in summary.lm, since you know that does the computations. Um, and... So this gives us the fitted values and their standard errors and nothing else. We now need to build the design matrix ourselves, but this is a very simple design matrix. It's got an intercept, one adjustment variable, and one SNP variable. 
And so we can build it very easily just with CBind. And then go and do the calculation. And then the rest of it is then basically the same. So if we look at this sampling time, the, we've gone from 14 seconds sampling time to 2 seconds. So there's been a big improvement. And the, the other thing that we see is that now LMFIT is using about a third of the time, which is a lot more respectable. CBind is using 10%. It's plausible that we could improve CBind a bit. In particular, if we passed around a fixed design matrix and modified the columns of it, that might well be faster than building it with CBind. So that would be a thing to look at. But otherwise, it's looking kind of plausible that we're, the most of the work we're doing is useful. So just, I didn't have, this isn't one I prepared previously, but it might be worth looking at, is that... Um, Okay. We'd need to pass that in, wouldn't we? Okay. People always say you shouldn't do this sort of thing live. Um, but let's see if it works. So what I'm going to do now is start off, is just make a matrix. Um, make a matrix X and pass it around and modify it rather than creating it each time. Now, it's, it's not obvious whether this will help, because if you're passing it in and modifying it, it's going to have to be recreated to some extent. Okay, so we're just modifying the third column of that matrix. Oh. Um, we didn't modify it enough. Ah. So it is. Yes, that's right. And so there's a, there's a sort of, that, that sort of thing says rewrite the whole matrix. Okay, so then it would make me make a new thing, yes. Is that yes, potentially. I mean, it, again, it's, there are no guarantees because this is all under the hood. Semantically, this doesn't change anything. Um, but it increases the chance that the memory will be reused. Um, of course, only if you actually get it 
Right. Um, which is why that you normally, you know, do unit tests and so on, rather than modifying your code on the fly in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> Okay, so we've got, it's very slightly faster, um, probably not, so it was about 1.9 something before, it's now 1.76 something, so it's not impressive, the um, extra, and we've got rid of the C bind as a major thing, but it hasn't improved stuff like that. Let's see how much it could have improved it. So C bind was taking about 0.2 of a second, and that's about what we seem to be saving. So it looks like it worked, but it might not have been worth doing anyway, um, unless we were doing a lot more of these. But there was a big saving from rewriting your own LM function to only do, use, do the bits of LM that you care about. The other big win um, is trying to find a different... Um, Algorithm. So another thing to try, potentially, it, as we saw with the t-test, is generating all the randomness at once in a matrix and trying to do things with matrix operations. So here we're going to make a <coughs> big matrix of permutations of y and um, fill it in and then use the fact that we've got the same... So the, this is a, we, we have to solve a slightly different problem here. If we had the same x and different y's, lots of different y's, nearly all the work of linear regression is computing the is inverting x transpose x, or not inverting it, but doing doing matrix stuff to x. And if x stays the same, then you get to reuse all that matrix stuff. Um, we can't quite do that with the original problem because we didn't, we had an extra adjustment variable that we didn't permute. Um, there are ways of getting around that. One is to regress y on the adjustment variables first and work with the residuals. But let's see how much that helps. So this is an example of not trying to speed up the, rather than speeding up the computation, replacing it with a different, faster computation. And it doesn't actually help. The reason it, one reason it doesn't help is that we can't parallelize the, we can't parallelize the generation of the permutations. We don't have a, we don't have a function that gives us a matrix of whose columns are permutations. We have to do it one at a time. Uh, it, would, you know, it wouldn't be terribly difficult. If you were doing this a lot, then you would write, you might go and write in C a function that does, that returns a matrix whose columns are permutations, and then this would be fast. Um, but the part of the uh, point of this tutorial is, is things that you don't require you to go and write C. Okay, so um, some back to some more techniques and ideas. Parallel processing. Now, parallel processing is very rarely, fairly rarely, faster than just running lots of copies of R. It may be simpler than running lots of copies of R because you get to start up one copy of R, type something, and have it all go off in parallel behind, uh, under the hood, but you know, it's going to be, it will be typically be faster if you need 100 cores just to run 100 copies of R. Um, if the parallel section is short, if you've got a long common piece that's common to everything, then a short parallel piece uh, and then another long common piece, then it may be 
less computationally expensive in total to parallelize. So because you're only the bits that don't go in parallel, you're only running them once rather than lots of times. And if you're paying per CPU second, then that could save you money. But it still won't be any faster to finish. The other thing is that shared memory may save you that if you have if you have R forking into the, the sort of parallel processing that the multi-core parts of the parallel package do, R will fork. It will split itself into copies, and those copies initially share the same memory. And the memory is shared until it gets modified, and then it gets copied so they each get their own. And so you can have a certain amount of savings of memory. And that was part of the motivation of the original multi-core package, that Shimon Obanek wrote where he'd have something that did a huge amount of setup work and created a big complicated object, then R split itself into lots of copies, they each got a reference to that big complicated object and they didn't have to recompute it themselves. So here we've got um, yeah, so here we've got an example doing a sort of fairly boring set of correlations with four cores or with L apply. And it's a fairly common trade-off. You have more, the parallel version uses more total CPU time, but finishes a bit faster. So it uses um, about twice as much CPU time in this case, but finishes in half the elapsed time. But it would be even faster just to run four copies of R, probably. Uh, redoing system setup work. So this is the example that I mentioned, where you have a lot of work to set up something up, then you split into multiple copies of R that can each use it. Um, So this is this is supposed to illustrate that, but it seems to be illustrating exactly the opposite. I have a feeling I must have this something backwards in the slide. So we've got two versions of this, but in one we modify the um, we split after we split into parallel computation, we modify the object and so it gets forced to really duplicate. And that should be slower, but it looks like it's faster, and so there must be... I have a feeling there's a mistake in the slide somewhere. Okay. Um, data storage... You know, I alluded to this earlier with the question about you know, really big matrices. At some point, you're not going to want everything in memory, and so there's the sort of rough rule of thumb that you don't want your objects much bigger than a third of physical memory. Um, how sharp that boundary is depends on your operating system. So, you know, a, a Mac, you can have bigger objects quite nicely, but there's a very sudden performance plummet when you suddenly get to the ed end of the operating system's tolerance. And so, you know, it's the sort of thing that varies depending on your operating system, but that's the sort of order, order of magnitude. So large things, well, large data frames in database tables, large arrays in some format for storing arrays, I use NetCDF, the HDF5 is another one, and large sparse matrices in sparse matrix formats. So database storage, uh, the American Community Survey is a two or three percent, it's the sort of incremental version of the U.S. Census. So every year, about two percent of households in the U.S. are sampled um, and uh, to provide incremental information between censuses. So the five-year person file is 16 gigabytes of CSVs. 
um, over 8 million records, and my laptop doesn't like it. In R. What you can do is to, it obvious, you can put the data into a database, and then, then you can then do two things with it. Firstly, you can read out bits of the data as needed. And the second thing you can do is you can do computations in the database, if they're relatively simple computations. And you can either do this with explicit SQL, or nowadays you can do it with dbplyr. So here's an example. I'm using MonetDB Lite. MonetDB is a Dutch research database. Um, the, um, it's optimized for scientific computing, for operations on columns of a database, uh, rather than most databases are op optimized for operations on rows of a database, because that's, what, that's the sort of database-y thing. Uh, and MonetDB, in particular, there's a version that embeds it into the R process, which gets you very quick um, data transfer or lack of data transfer. But you can do similar sorts of things with other databases. So I'm loading that. Um, dplyr and dbplyr. Um, hands up, people who've used, used dplyr have used dplyr. Yeah, it's about good. Um, other people, somebody's going to force you to do it at some point. <laughs> um, the, so we, here we're setting up a connection to a database. So I've read the data in the CSVs into MonoDB, which, as I said, took about 10 minutes. Uh, but you only have to do it once. This is a tibble, a um, dplyr data frame-like thing, which is, doesn't actually have any data to it. It's just a pointer to the database table. And it won't do anything until you actually force it to compute. It's just sitting there pointing at the table. Um, so do I have, this is where, this is the one we're going to do. So um, that's a bit worrying. Okay, I'll show you that one. Maybe I'll show you that one later then. Hmm. Um. Uh. <coughs> I'm not sure what's happened to that one. I'll show you this one later. Um, but the point is that it's... Um, that these, these will operate, these will um, happen very quickly. So that if you want to do operations of the sort that SQL is good at, then doing them in the database will be a lot faster than reading the data into R. Uh, and so the sorts of things it's good at here is, you know, number of... Um, so this is a table of the number of people in each age. This is 
grouping by state, looking at the mean age of people in each state. This is grouping by state and looking at a weighted mean of the age of the people in each group, because this is actually a complex survey with unequal sampling probabilities. So those sorts of computations that can be expressed in SQL will run much faster in a suitable database than they will if you load the data into R and run it again. Um, Hannes Mulison, who did um, the MonoDB interface, has timings showing that this is faster than any of the other database interfaces and um, competitive with the other um, large file interfaces um, that are using things like memory mapped files. Um, so this is so this is a useful strategy and you can do quite a lot of computation with the sorts of things you can express in SQL plus common extensions like the exponential function. So for example if you want to fit generalized linear models all the computations you need there's all the computations you need that involve the whole data are sums, sums of products and then an exponential or two for the link function and so that they can all be done as SQL expressions. Also, in, in, another, in some applications, you've got large matrices with mostly zero entries. One of the ones that I encounter is DNA sequence data on cohorts of people, where most of the, DNA, most of the genetic variants you see, you only see one or two copies of in a few thousand people. And so the matrix is almost entirely zeros. The matrix package, capital M, supports sparse matrices and they're represented in a compressed form that basically leaves out all the zeros. It, you just have something saying how many zeros there are and it skips to the next actual number. Okay, so here we've got a um, 5,000 by 4,000 matrix um, that's a, just an ordinary R matrix. Here we've got it as a capital M matrix and it's got um, so it's got 2 million entries but it's only got 287,000 real entries. Uh, and so these are the non, the, those are the non-zero elements of the matrix. So the sparse version of the matrix is about 3.5 megabytes the full version is um, 160 megabytes and if you want to for example take a cross product of this matrix itself to, to uh, the, the covariance which you use in computing the uh, depending which way round you're doing it either the kinship matrix or the linkage disequilibrium matrix then it takes about two tenths of a second with the sparse version and about 1.6 seconds with the dense version. So there are two th savings here. The first is that storing, you don't have to transfer the zeros in and out of memory because they're not represented. And the second thing is we know what you get when you multiply anything by zero, so you don't need to do that calculation. If you can do even better in situations um, where you don't need access to the initial, el the, the actual elements of the matrix. So sometimes you do. Sometimes you need to know what the element in row 37 and column 502 is. But often you only need to be able to multiply by a matrix. So there's a lot of linear algebra algorithms where all you need is the ability to multiply by your matrix. Um, so uh, iterative solvers like the conjugate gradient algorithm and its more sophisticated relatives and um, singular value decompositions and eigen decompositions. They only take multiplications. And so that means that if you can compute the result of applying your matrix to a vector, you're allowed to cheat. You don't have to do it by doing the multiplication. You have to get the same answer, but you don't have to do it by doing the multiplication. And there are two cases where this is particularly fast. One is sparse matrices, 
because they're mostly zero and you don't need to do most of the multiplications. And the other is projection matrices, where you're basically getting residuals from some regression. Uh, as a particularly trivial version of that, if you wanted to mean center a vector, that is multiplying it by a projection matrix. You could produce an n by n projection matrix, multiply the vector by it, and that would take n squared operations. Or you could just subtract off the mean, which takes n operations. That's, again, that one's trivial. Less trivial is that if you wanted to do the projection that result that's equivalent to taking the residuals in a linear regression, that you can do in basically np squared rather than n squared time by subtracting off the residuals, essentially. And so that's, that works if your matrix is sparse or is a projection, but it also works if your matrix is a product of things that are sparse or projections. So if your matrix is a, a projection matrix times a sparse matrix, then it will still work. So here we've got the silly example with means where it takes six tenths of a second to do it with the matrix and it takes 20 nanoseconds to do it with the mean. But the examples that come up in... Um, there are genetic examples that come up where you have a big matrix that's the product of a projection matrix to do with the adjustment variables in your model, and then a sparse matrix that's a sparse genetic data matrix. And you can multiply by each of those very quickly, and so you can get very quick algorithms. So in situations where you're working with large matrices, there are often opportunities to be clever. Now, here we have a, a more interesting example, uh, a more sort of fun example for people to work on, which is Conway's life. How people who have actually used, have encountered Conway's game of life before? People who have implemented it before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, So what it's doing, life basic, there we are. What it's doing, there are cells, you've got a potentially infinite, but actually, you know, finite, grid of cells that you can think of as alive or dead. If a cell has zero, one, or has zero, if a live cell has 0, 1, let's see, it's got eight neighbors. So if, it, it's, if, it, if a dead cell has exactly three neighbors, it becomes alive. If a live cell has 0, 1, 2, or 6, 7, 8 neighbors, it dies, um, and otherwise it stays the same. And so there's a rule that basically you get these patterns spreading. You get quite complicated patterns. Um, and this sort of cellular automaton, you can produce versions of them that are universal computers like Turing machines and so on. But mainly, this one's interesting because you've got a fairly simple rule and you can produce quite interesting and complicated patterns. Um, however, it's kind of slow. We have the code. What the code does, we have a function that gets the number of alive neighbors. So this says which are the neighbors for each point. There's a function that does the plot. Function that updates the plot. So it doesn't redraw the axes, it just redraws all the rectangles. And then there's the update function, which says that if you've got, if it's alive and you've got less than two neighbors, it dies. If it's alive and it's got two or three neighbors, it stays alive. 
If it's alive and it's got more than three neighbours, it dies. If it's dead and it's got exactly three neighbours, it becomes alive. And this is done in a loop over the, all the cells in the board. Um, and then this loop just runs. So, I'm going to let you go and um, see if you can, what you can do to speed that up or play around with it. And then we'll come and look at some um, solutions of various sorts. Okay, so I mean, you want to show you the database stuff on a different data set and then look at the life. Um, the data set that I do actually have on my laptop is the New Zealand vehicle database, which is all the motor vehicles in New Zealand, registered or not, which is about 5 million records. So we've got um, a connection to the database. We say what um, tables are there. There's this vehicles table. And then we make a dplyr table that's a connection to that. And if you just print that table, what you get is the first few records and nothing else. Or you can do, for example, cars group by basic color, summarize n. So how many, this is a table of um, colors for of cars in New Zealand. Or you can get more than one piece of information out. So this is for each color, the number of cars and the maximum number of seats. As you can see, this data could do with a bit of cleaning. <laughs> um, they nearly all have, you know, so what we can do, for example, what we might want to do at this point is um, filter number of seats. Some of these are buses and so on, so they might have quite a lot of seats, even though not 926. Um, so if we filter for number of seats less than, say, eight, so these operations are fairly quick. Um, obviously, that's um, They're all happening in the database. So what happens here, if we do, I think this is right. No, not build SQL. Um, no, render SQL. Does any, don't suppose anyone happens to remember what the, um, No, I mean, it's, what? Show SQL? No. Um, build SQL. Build SQL, that sounds plausible, yes. I think that's the one. That's what I was... No. Plausible but wrong, okay. Yep, okay. So that's what this does, so that's the query, and if you actually, it, it all just creates a sort of lazy table that isn't actually evaluated until you force it to be evaluated. So in this case, printing it forces an evaluation. Or we could, um, and you can see that it's a fairly quick operation to, um, to do the calculations on, in this case, five million records. So if you want to do those sorts of calculations that SQL is competent to do, then using a database is fairly efficient and using dbplyr as the interface to the database is fairly civilized from an R point of view. Trying to program 
things using dbplyr is a bit more complicated because you have to get around, rather than using the traditional sort of quoting and evaluation in a data frame stuff in R, there's all new um, quote, quasi quotation stuff in the tidyverse and you have to learn that, but it's, you know, it's tractable, it's just, you put lots of question marks everywhere and, you know, you can learn it. But, um, so programming, it's a bit of, uh, there's a bit, is a bit of effort, but just using it is fairly straightforward, very straightforward. Okay, so the other thing, four people fall asleep or whatever, the other thing is, So if we run the, where are we? Yes, okay, so that's the, so if we, the f what's the first thing that we should do to speed this code up? Yes. Now here, we're not so much, t we're not timing the whole thing. I mean, it runs forever, and so timing the whole thing isn't terribly helpful. But what we're going to do is run it for a while and see where it's spending most of its time. And they want to let it get through a few updates. Okay, so where, what are we doing? It's finding, um, it's spending mo the, nearly all of its time in rect. Um, and if you, you know, watch it, that's, the, the rect is the function that draws the rectangles and that certainly seems to be where it's spending a lot of time. And if you look at the code, then um, it goes and so where's rec? That's so it's it's this update plot function that's doing all the work, and what it's doing is calling rect separately for each point. So it's drawing it's drawing it's doing a loop, and each iteration of the loop, it's drawing one rectangle. So that's crying out to be vectorized. Uh, assume we, so. The first thing we check to see is can rect draw more than one rectangle at a time. And so we go and look at the help for rect. And we find that, yes, it can draw more than one ve rectangle at a time. You just give it vectors of the corners. So this version, we vectorize the plotting. And so what's happening in the, we've got this update plot too. We've got i, this is all the i's, so it goes from one to the number of rows, number of columns times, so it goes one to number of rows, one to number of rows, etc. And then this is all the j's, so it goes one to the number of columns and each is repeated number of rows, so it goes one, 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 two, 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 and so on. You could also get this effect with expand.grid and then it draws the, all the rectangles. Um, so these are the coordinates of all the rectangles, and then these are the colors of all the rectangles. Yes, life.r. And so we he it's fast enough that we can now do a much bigger um, computation, much bigger grid, and we can still have the much bigger grid updating fast enough that things are moving on it. 
So that's been a huge increase, uh, a huge improvement. And we can see, let's just time it and see how long we're... Um, run for a while. And in principle, stopping it early might be a problem. It might take the performance bottlenecks for the first few iterations might be different from the long-term ones. But, you know, anything could be a problem. And so it's at least a place to start. So now, we're now spending um, only, we're now only spending quite a bit less of the time in um, rect. It's still, the, it's still the slowest computation, but it's, yeah. Um, because that is the, I mean, that's the, it's the, it is the, drawing pictures on the screen is actually quite a complicated activity. Uh, and it's, this will also depend a bit on what system you've got. If you've got a, you know, a raw X Windows server thing, then it might be faster than if you've got some more sophisticated thing. But um, what else can we do? We can vectorize the neighbor computations because the neighbor computations, uh, we're saying for each element we're going to add up these eight neighbors. We can vectorize that by um, saying for all the points at once, we can add up all the appropriate sets of neighbors. And, you know, this is a pain because you have to work out exactly what each sets of indices are and you'll get it wrong and then you'll have to do it again and, you know, it's just going to go on and it's a pain. But it does offer potential for speeding the thing up. So this is an example of something you wouldn't do unless you needed to speed it up. But if you do need to speed it up, it's an obvious thing to try. This is an even bigger. And this one you can see is sort of lurching a bit. Part of the, it's getting big enough we're having that the memory overhead is getting non-trivial. Here we can have a sort of pretty example. Yeah. So, okay, pretty example. Uh, So this is a construction called a glider gun. So the thing in the bottom left wobbles backwards and forwards in a complicated cycle and it shoots off those little things called gliders that move basically forever in the same direction. This was the first proof that you could get non-periodic uh, structures that grow without bounds in life because this is obviously not, it's not periodic because the furthest glider keeps moving and it clearly grows without bounds. So that you know, it's now fast enough that we can see those sorts of patterns. So if we wanted to see more of this, that was with two glider guns, okay. So if we wanted to see more of the patterns, one thing we could do, plotting is still the slowest part of the process, so we could just not plot every iteration. If we wanted to see the sort of long-term evolution of it, we could say plot every tenth iteration instead of every iteration. Hmm? 
it's, it's not bad for things like glider guns. It's, it depends on what you're looking at. Some things it looks bit terrible. Um, and it may, yeah. Okay, so there we are. That one. So you can see what happens when one glider gun shoots the other um, reasonably efficiently with the fast forward and wait and see if any of the shrapnel hits the first one. And it's still a bit jerky, but it's... Um, and you can see that the first glider gun does actually get blown up by its as well. Okay. Next improvement, we can draw only the changes. Most of the pixels stay the same between iterations, so we can draw only the ones that change. So here the change is that we've got update plot has now got two arguments, alive and was alive, and it changes, it only plots the changes where alive is not equal to was alive. And as you can see, that's much faster. And it's still fairly smooth. There is a little bit, they do leave a little bit of a trail, and that's due to not when you draw over the top, you don't get rectangles. There's this problem about what happens with the border. And um, so you get that sort of slight trail that the gliders leave, but it's quite a nice effect. So you could pretend it was deliberate. <laughs> so we've gone from something that was basically you couldn't see anything happening, it was so slow, to something where you can see the long-term progress of quite complicated structures. And it's been mostly by vectorization and to some extent by optimizations, not drawing things that don't change, finding out that drawing is the bottleneck. And so firstly, vectorizing it, and secondly, not doing it where we don't have to. Now, the details will be different for any your code you're trying to optimize, they always will be different, but at least this, the sorts of principles of how you might go about it are vaguely similar. So, um, very briefly, random algorithms. So, our principal components, people who, every, well, anyone done principal components? Yeah. Anyone done it on a big matrix? Some people, yep. So it, if you've got an n by n matrix, then it takes n m squared time. Uh, normally you don't want all the, and that gives you all the principal components. Normally you don't want them all. You want the first, you know, two or the first 96 or whatever. Um, and it turns out that there are very simple um, fast randomized algorithms for getting the first few principal components that look like they couldn't possibly work. But what you do is you take a random projection of your data into, um, a, into, K into a smaller number of dimensions and do the singular value decomposition of that projection. And the leading singular vectors will be very similar to the, to the leading singular vectors of the full matrix. And there are, you know, probabilistic bounds and proofs and so on around this. You could also do this the old-fashioned way with Lanchos-type algorithms for getting uh, the first few um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The, and these, this, is a, this, writ, this approach written in R is about you end up with maybe 50 or 60 lines of R and it's simple and it works. Whereas Lanchos algorithms are notoriously um, scary to implement because of all the, you need in, in, enormous care about rounding error. 
all over the place. And you end up with things that are about this much, Fortran or C++. Uh, so this is very simple. It's the, the, the randomness is attractive from a statistical point of view, and they're actually just as good. They actually work in practice. Um, let's try. Probable reason, no such file or directory. That would be a plausible reason, yes. Um, ah, that would be, well, it didn't, yeah, it didn't find it. I don't know why it didn't find it, but I can um, load it from the package anyway. Um, let that work for a little while. Another, I will come back to that when it's finished computing. Another example is uh, subsampling, that you can take random subsamples from a large data set, analyze them, and sort of pull them together to get um, very essentially the same estimate as you would by analyzing the whole data set. Or as a variation on that, for generalized linear models on large data sets, take a small random subset, fit the model to that, and then do a one-step update using the whole data set computed in a database. I'll be talking about that on Thursday. Yes, okay. So here we've seen, this is comparing the full singular value decomposition to the stochastic singular value decomposition on this matrix, and we're looking at... Um, 100 seconds of user time versus one and a half seconds of user time. And that's not the right example. Um, oh, this one didn't. Have to load the matrix package, yes. Uh, And using, taking advantage of the sparseness of the matrix, so that here we're doing the, the stochastic singular value decomposition, but taking advantage of the fact that it's a sparse matrix, we get another order of magnitude speed up. So that's another, so there's a lot of research nowadays into randomized algorithms of various sorts. But this is one that's particularly potentially useful in statistics, whether for visualization or other sorts of statistics. The stochastic SVD is a way of getting some moderate number of principal components out of a large matrix. So, in summary, for the, um, the simple rule about optimization is there aren't any simple rules. Uh, you have to measure stuff and then sort of think about it. Uh, vectorization is almost always worthwhile if you can do it. Um, you need to, otherwise you need to experiment with a bunch of things and find out what works. And that there's often the biggest win is by improving the algorithm. And this is where it's worth keeping up with modern tools, whether modern software tools like databases and so on, or modern uh, algorithmic improvements like um, stochastic SVD for fast principal components. Thank you.